folks. Hello, hello, hello. We are going to be getting started tonight. Um, my name is Erica Serrano. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the events assistant here at Books for Magic. Before we get started, I did want to go over some housekeeping points for tonight. First off, we kindly ask that you do keep your mask on at all times while at this event. Towards the end of the event, we will be doing an audience raised hand Q&A, so please start thinking of questions to ask now and raise your hand when the time comes. After the talk tonight, Nahid will be signing and personalizing books at the desk near the side door where you all came in. We also have additional books available to purchase from my colleague Jax in the back. If you are joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we highly encourage you to buy a copy of Mirror Made of Brain online using the link in the live stream description. All right, so tonight it's my privilege to introduce Nahid Filos Patel and Sasha Bonet, who are here to discuss Nahid's new book, Mirror Made of Rain. In this book, we follow Numi Wadia, who dazzles you with her sharply funny insight and compelling choices as she traverses contemporary Indian culture and societal expectation. Numi's world is made up of deeply complex and dynamic characters, from mothers who struggle in secret, to fathers with their heart on their sleeve, to the sometimes awful men who penetrated her life. Numi's journey is full of heart as we watch her wrestle with wanting to break free from what everyone around her expects of her, and eventually, how she creates her own space in the world. Nahid Firoz Patel is a graduate of the MFA program at the Columbia University School of the Arts. Her writing has appeared in the New England Review, The Guardian, HuffPost, Scrollin, Bomb Magazine, Public Books, PEN America, The Rumpus, Europe Now Journal, Asymptote Journal, and elsewhere. As I mentioned earlier, Sasha Bonet will be in conversation with Nahid tonight. Sasha is a writer, cultural critic, and educator living in New York City. Bonet is currently at work on a narrative nonfiction book titled The Water Bearers, a sweeping cultural history that centralizes intergenerational stories of Black womanhood as a lens to explore the evolution of America. She studied at Columbia University's Creative Writing MFA program and currently teaches nonfiction writing as an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University's School of the Arts and Barnard's English department. So, without further delay, everyone please give a very warm welcome to Nahid and Sasha. Congratulations to Nahid for this you. beautiful book. If you haven't been able to see it yet, it's such a beautiful cover too. Do oh. they allow you to help out with the cover or no? Yeah, they were really nice about, um, I want, yeah, they, they did definitely, ha I did have a say in the cover, which was really nice and felt really good. And I had a definite di direction that I wanted to go with, so. Beautiful. Thank you. So Nahid's gonna s open us up with a little bit uh, an excerpt. Um, so I'm just going to read um, from the, the first part of the book, which is like, um, it's a flashback in which Numi is a little girl and she's going with her family to play tambola, which is a uh, bingo, yeah, um, at, a, like a, at an exclusive club um, in India. And um, I'll just start reading. As it turned out, Zal Papa's instincts were correct. My parents never had a happy marriage. Then Asha lost her second baby late in the third trimester, and with that, her mental health. There were moms who put love notes in their children, children's lunch boxes, and there was Asha, who'd once picked me up from school five hours late, who sent me to birthday parties wearing torn underwear. Jay's reaction to Asha's rapid decline was to retreat further and further into his books and passive, absent-minded absent denial. I was raised part-time by two women, a loving Aya and Lily Mama, who would take me downstairs to her bed when I was sick, put Vicks vapor rub on my neck and tie a handkerchief around it to ease my frequent coughs and colds. Sometimes, as kids, my cousin Adil and I would sleep in our grandparents' bed between them. After they'd managed to get us to, to, stop, to stop wiggling around, and fighting about who was hogging the blanket, Zal Papa would put down his Jeffrey Archer, switch off his bedside lamp, extend his hand to Lily Mama and say, Hatapo, give me your hand. Their arms would form an arch over our sleepy bodies as a slowly whirling fan dusted our heads with a soft breeze. I'd always read to Adil before we fell asleep. 
Enid Blyton's stories of English children, foolhardy but always well-dressed, with shiny shoes and not torn underwear, with neat side parts and pink fingernails. Their mothers were good eggs, the fathers charmingly neglectful. I was determined to live in England when I grew up, where I would eat buttered scones and crumpets every day. I carried a famous five book with me everywhere I went, stuffed in a teddy bear backpack my parents brought from London. I'd read in the park, at school, at the dinner table. I'd even tried to read by the light of orange street lamps as they sprinted past the car window on the way to the Jim Khanna Club for Saturday Tambola. In the front seat, my mother pulled out a water bottle from her handbag. Holding it between her, her knees, she lit a cigarette, blowing tusks of smoke from her nostrils. She unscrewed the top and took a swig before passing it to Jay, who said something that I couldn't get over the roar of a passing water tanker. It was funny, whatever he said. My mother tossed back her head, letting out a beautiful brassy laugh. She hadn't laughed like that in weeks. Ma, look what I'm wearing, I said, putting down my book, smiling from the dark of the back seat. I had on a dress with a bib of frills that my mother had purchased on one of her foreign trips with money smuggled in a talcum powder tin. I didn't like the clothes she brought me, tight outlandish Western outfits that in our town invited looks. Asha would complain to anyone in earshot how I never wore all the expensive clothes she'd bought. I wore the dress, hoping she'd be pleased. Balancing, balancing the bottle on her thigh with one hand, Asha turned around to look at me. The car went over a speed bump and the drink splashed all over her sandals. The car began to smell like the cotton swabs nurses dab on your skin before a shot. Oh, bleep, bleep, Miss Expert, Expertus. <laughs> I want to say anything. Oh, bleep, Asha said, jerking her head back to the front, shaking her leg like it had caught fire. I groaned. I was eight years old and knew about hangovers. I was in for a few extra slaps tomorrow. Saturday Tambola was the most exciting thing in town, and Asha, Jay, and I found our seats at a checkered clock table on the club lawn. A few men stopped by to talk with Jay, but no women stopped by to talk with Asha. Standing fans coaxed the sluggish air. Kids roved about in bands. That was rude, Asha said, as the man who had been speaking with Jay walked off. What was rude, Jay asked, waiting for a waiter, waving for a waiter in a black bow tie to come over. He didn't even say hello to me, she said, taking her cigarettes out of her purse. I squirmed on the plastic seat, scratching out numbers without enthusiasm, while my mother, while my parents sat in silence, drinking sweating glasses of beer and eating peanuts. Earlier in the evening, I'd seen Ardil sitting under his ta parents' table, playing with kids from school. I went over and asked if I could play with them. They refused and stuck out their tongues. Empty beer bottles multiplied like rabbits under my parents' table, and mosquito coils burned in the grass. In the still and airless night, the smoke rose straight up like white puppet strings. After she'd finished her cigarettes, Asha lit the leftover matches and flicked them at the coils. I stared, mesmerized by the small tumbling flames. Asha leaned over and gave my thigh a vicious pinch. I screamed. When will you learn to sit properly, Asha said. You want to show the entire lawn your underwear? I'm sorry, Mama, I said, crying, looking around for Jay, who would left us to get a whiskey. This was Asha's gift, to keep the world awed and puzzling, to make me feel guilty of crimes I hadn't committed to mangle reality until it was bled of truth. Asha, what the hell are you doing? Jay said, coming back. Why is she crying? Just uh, teaching her how to sit, Asha said, her face like a storm cloud as she began raking through the ashtray with her forefinger, spilling ash on the table. You're sozzled, Jay said. He placed his hands protectively on my shoulders. Asha found a half-finished cigarette and lighting it replied, yeah, so are you. Asha, Jay hissed, and I saw two dozen necks craning toward us. You see any other women, other mothers, drinking, smoking? People don't let their kids play with Numi because of you, because of your reputation. What about you? Asha shot back. What are you doing to help her? She crossed her arms and blew smoke rings. Hypocrite. Jay and Asha hissed and spat insults at each other, their faces twisting into rageful masks neither caring if people stared. 
When I couldn't take it anymore, I made an excuse to get away. I'm going to the bathroom, I said. I need to pee. The stall door did not shut all the way. I pushed it closed as far as it would go, then crouched over the smelly squat toilet and peed. I hoped my parents were done fighting. While I was dragging up my underwear, Ardil pushed open the stall door. He and his friends stared, mouths open like baby chicks. I'd wanted to grab their heads and knock them together, but shock glued my feet to the ground. My face felt like a hot skillet. I screamed. They scattered, giggling, guffawing. I pulled up my underwear, tears pricking at my eyes. The bathroom's oval mirror was clouded with fingerprints and was cracked at the bottom right corner. I pried at it until a chip the size of a guitar pick came off. I ran my thumb along its edge. Blood bloomed from a small cut. I put my thumb in my mouth. It tasted like a one rupee coin. Maybe I'll cut Ardil with this, I thought, slipping the mirror piece in my pocket. I turned on the tap and watched my blood swirl into the drain. Outside, Tambola was over and people had begun to leave. Ardil and his friends were nowhere to be seen. I'd have to wait until tomorrow for my revenge. Jake came walking up from the lawn, helping Asha how you'd help an injured athlete off the field. She was humming to herself softly. Let's go, Jay said as he came to where I stood. Mama isn't well. That was such a good um, section to read from because I feel like you get such a great understanding of the relationship uh, or the kind of um, main relationship of the book. Um, just a little bit of uh, backstory is that Nikita and I met at Columbia. We were both studying mm -hmm. and our initial conversations um, circled around motherhood and in very kind of um, practical ways. Um, how are we going to come to class and how are we going to find um, childcare and mm -hmm. kind of sharing um, practical notes with each other. Um, and my daughter is here and uh, Nahid and I kind of also talked about, you know, the kind of need and desire that we had to be at Columbia. And in some ways uh, it could feel, I would feel sometimes even guilty for um, not being with my baby and being um, at the university pursuing my dreams in this really hard city um, and putting her through it, you know, for my own sake. But I think uh, one of the beautiful things about this book is that it kind of explores the relationship between a mother and a daughter and the way that um, you reflect off of one, each, of one of another and the ways that we kind of mimic one another and learn from one another. Um, and also, when you don't actually follow what your desires are and pay attention to your needs, how you can grow to resent mm -hmm. your child, um, even though that's not something that's always spoken about because the mother is supposed to be a certain way. And I think we heard a little bit of that um, from that excerpt alone. So I did want to kind of open up um, in talking about this, in talking about how much your own personal relationship with, um, from what I understand, you came to New York to go to the program to, to further your career, mm -hmm. um, how much were you able to relate to some of these characters and how much were you able to talk about things through them that are maybe too difficult to express um, kind of plainly? Um, and did you identify with Asha at all um, as far as the ways that that kind of resentment can build up? So I think that, um, you know, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a paradox for me because I really only um, seriously thought about becoming a writer and becoming an artist after like I was already pregnant with my daughter. And for some reason before that, the path, I couldn't see the path to, you know, I was a lawyer for a while and a journalist, um, but I just felt like I could not give myself the permission to be an artist. And something about being pregnant or, you know, having a child and you know, I think, <laughs> not to sound mawkish, but wanting to leave something for the child, for your child, something that they can, you know, read maybe one day and know who their mother was um, in some way. Um, I don't know, that kind of motivated me to start considering uh, writing, taking writing seriously and taking my writing seriously. 
um, and Colombia was the only place I applied to. Um, and my daughter was, I think, two years old at the time. And, you know, um, I don't know if how, it, maybe it's changed now, but like, I definitely felt like there was this whole idea that, you know, um, your artist life and your mother life have to have a wall between them. Like there should be no osmosis between those two parts of your life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember feeling almost ashamed of being a mother. Like somehow I was less than everybody else pursuing their art mm -hmm. and giving everything to their art. I also remember like, I don't know how it was for you, but like, you know, once class was over, I had to run back while everybody else was smoking cigarettes and <laughs> making friends and, you know, like, um, but for me, I was like, no, I got to go pick up my kid. Right. Um, I never felt resentful, but I did feel sh strange shame um, as if I was like, like an imposter syndrome, but mm -hmm. I was like pulling one over everybody because I had this secret child <laughs> that I was not supposed to tell anyone about. Yeah. And I felt like, and I don't know, I just feel like that was very much the, the energy and the atmosphere in the, you know, at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I never felt like my, I mean, yeah, I think that, um, you know, having a child definitely messes with your faculty to just daydream and just mm. aimlessly think about things. And, right. you know, um, there's this scene in... Uh, is it, is, was it, is it called The Lost Daughter? What is, what's the name of the Elena Ferrante movie that just came out? Is it The Lost uh, Daughter? Yes. So there's this one scene in that where Le young Lena, she's kind of like trying to figure something out in her head. She's like, she's putting, she's thinking of something. She's putting two and two together. She has to give this talk. And, she, and you can see she's deep in thought. And then her daughter just like, like, you know, hits her and she's like, you know, and like, I felt that in my bones, because <laughs> right. like, that's what, that's the thing. It's just not having that space to really kind of explore and, <clears throat> you know, because you're constantly, you know, putting out fires and you're, you're mm -hmm. leaping from one emergency to another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it is true that, you know, um, when a mother fails, she kind of fails all by herself. It's like a very lonely mm -hmm. failure as opposed to a father who I think, you know, society feels like they can step in more when a father is kind of um, faltering or failing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then the, that becomes a representation of, like, the wife and what she's not doing yeah. um, to help him. Um, oh, oh, yeah, definitely. So Jay gets a lot of, this is a uh, character, he gets a lot of space um, in the book from everyone. Yeah. Um, um, as if he is not complicit, as if they are not living in the same house, and as if he is just a good guy who got matched up with the wrong woman. Yeah. Um, instead of the ways that they both were a part of this entanglement together, um, and um, Mimi having to be along for this kind of ride, mm -hmm. but not that the father should have stepped in and told her how to put on clean underwear for a sleepover, mm -hmm. right? It's all about yeah. the mother taking the blame and what it means for Numi to witness this, mm -hmm. um, to witness kind of, we're getting to see Numi making realizations about gender mm -hmm. and sexuality um, and figuring these things out from this kind of perspective of a younger person, mm -hmm. which is what I find uh, really, really um, most interesting about the book is just like the character evolves over time and we get to see them kind of growing up and there are a lot of flashbacks. Mm -hmm. um, so I can imagine or I wonder how much of that is you being able to kind of sense certain things because you're a mother and because you're seeing this young girl and um, even with when I'm with my daughter, I'm seeing so much in different ways based on her gaze, which is from the bottom looking up. Mm -hmm. um, and that gaze is very present. It's like you even kind of situate her under tables and like, mm -hmm. you know, um, close to the ground, mm -hmm. you know. And so we have this perspective of kind of looking up at these big people and showing how a community is actually responsible for Asha, mm -hmm. um, not Jay or not you know, just her, it's actually that all of this community is failing her and therefore failing Numi. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the book is about reflections, which the title Mirror Made of Rain, maybe you can speak a little bit more about that. It comes up in the book as a lake. 
mm -hmm. um, that the grandmother, um, they said my grandmother told me that a lake is a mirror made of rain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's quite early on in the book. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what is, why did you position it there? And like, what is, how are you, what kind of signal are you sending to the reader at that point that we should be focused on moving forward? I think that's a really, I, I never even realized the, but yeah, children are close, low to the ground mm -hmm. and they do kind of, the view is always of them looking up. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really interesting that um, there's this whole community, right? That it basically treats Asha as like a, you know, a social pariah mm -hmm. and blames her for her failure as a mother and her failure as a wife. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it, it's, again, it's very like, in, it's your fault. Like you need to f fix your shit and mm -hmm. like, you know, sober up and whatever, look after your child. Mm -hmm. But it's really, and it's not, um, Numi is observing something that the community is not picking up on, mm -hmm. which is that it's it's a system mm -hmm. that's kind of, you know, creating this. And it's very much also a response to the stifling patriarchy and this in the sex the sexism and the mm -hmm. the debt by a thousand cuts that, you know, that is honestly um, Indian society in a small town, which is where I grew up and that's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. And I think that Numi offers like an almost like an outsider's point of view to that because everybody who's in that milieu thinks this is very normal, right. you know. But somehow Numi, because she's a child, because she's not yet as jaded or as like um, she can perceive that what's being done to her mother is not fair, right. and that her father, even though he seems like a really good guy and he's really like you know, plays the, the helpless, you know, hapless uh, good guy mm -hmm. is also kind of impl complicit right. in her mother's self-destruction. Right. Yeah, right? totally. And maybe it's because of Asha's condition and her illness with um, um, alcoholism that she's not being groomed in the same way as everyone else around her. Mm -hmm. So she's able to have a kind of free thought mm -hmm. form. Yeah. Um, that these other people around her aren't able to have. And I really love that you weren't using all of this language throughout the book that's so kind of common now around like all these words around patriarchy and sexism. And mm -hmm. there was this way that Numi kind of crystallized everything in such a kind of authentic, she's such a devastatingly real person on the page. Um, it's like, you know, you kind of start to dislike her, mm -hmm. but then you question yourself, like, this is actually only a young person. Why, do, you know, what am I thinking about not liking her? And you kind of get upset with her because she keeps, you know, making all these mistakes, mm -hmm. but then you also have to, it really, um, you make the reader have to question themselves um, as they're reading, as they're starting to kind of judge Numi along the way, it makes the reader also complicit in this and it, it makes the reader kind of have to look at themselves mm -hmm. in the same way that the reflection is happening all around the book, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, how do you know who you are if you aren't comparing yourself to the community around you? And if you are seeing yourself in one way, how is this community responsible? So I feel like Numi is such a beautifully um, illustrated character. Um, that's really hard to do, I think, in on, in books, in films, is to really kind of create a character that is able to experience pain and joy um, and be difficult um, and be misunderstood. Um, there's just this way that you're able to also let her grow and change, and the way she gets to know her mother along the way um, really, really, I think, shows kind of the, com the complicated nature of a mother-daughter relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, so back to, I do wanna, I do wanna stay on the title just a little bit because mm -hmm. I wanna see how you arrived there and what you are, why you are positioning it this way for the reader and what you are communicating to the reader um, through the title and the positioning of the title, which shows up in the first part of the book. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was, it's funny, you know, when you, when you talk about Numi as a character, like um, just the other day, Victor Laval tweeted something. He said that if you're reading a book where, you know, everything bad is happening to the main character, but they're not doing anything bad to anyone, right. like don't read that book. <laughs> it's a bad book. Um, or That's not true. bad, it's like a moral thing, but it's, That's it's, true. it's, a, it's a crappy book. 
Um, and, and I think that, I don't know, like I studied under Victor and he was always pushing us to constantly complicate, subvert expectations, mm -hmm. kind of really go in there and just mess things up mm -hmm. in terms of like, you know, who's good, who's bad. Mm -hmm. And I think it confused a few readers as well because they were like, wait, am I, I you know, the, the whole idea of like, give us someone to cheer for. Right. Like, you can't really cheer for Numi right. because she's a complete fuck up, <laughs> right? So what do you do? Right. Um, but I was really keen on not um, putting my hand on the scales for any one character and therefore I also kind of like, I didn't, you know, there are many really sexist things that happen in the book and there's a lot of patriarchy that's kind of mm -hmm. explored, but there's no character that stands up and goes like, oh, dead to the patriarchy, like, mm -hmm. this is bad, this right. is good. You know, it's all left up to the... I wanted to create as much space as possible for the reader to come and sit with these characters and kind of, you know, find out what they think. Mm -hmm. And I think that the idea of the mirror... <laughs> The, 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 the mirror as a through line was actually a suggestion from my Indian editor mm. because he saw that Numi has a complicated relationship with mirrors. There are mirrors all through the book, if mm -hmm. you notice. And um, she doesn't really like the way she looks, so she can't look at herself for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of, you know, began thinking of that, um, heightening that metaphor. And then if you really... You know, if you really talk, think about it, and I have said this before in other interviews, but I really do feel like we're all just looking for ourselves mm -hmm. in art, in books, and in, you know, everything. And I think that a, a book that reflects us back, some, some part of us back to ourselves is a book that we can connect to or, you know. And <sighs> Numi is a mirror in the sense because she makes you think about yourself and how you are reacting to her. Mm -hmm. Because she's doing the things that she's doing, but it's really how the reader kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, signs on to her journey that matters. Mm -hmm. So the reader is very much a very important part of the book, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I can yeah. feel that. Right? Yeah. Like the book is nothing without a reader. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can feel that you're very much present and thinking about that because you can feel that on the page. I'm constantly going back and rereading pages because I'm questioning my response mm -hmm. to Numi. Yeah. Um, and questioning, like, there are moments where, uh, for example, she's going up to the room um, at the wedding, at the engagement party, and you're thinking, like, Numi, you don't want to go up to that room mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's a very bad idea. But at the same time, I'm saying, girls and young women, or pe women in general, are allowed to do dumb things without having to be sexually violated for mm -hmm. their... Oh yeah, um, for their choices, yeah. right? And so you're constantly uh, putting that in front of us. I mean, it shows up in this way. Um, the sexual assault shows up so kind of like rain. You mm -hmm. know, it's so natural. It's a part of growing up, mm -hmm. and you don't make a big fuss about it. It's mm -hmm. just kind of like this is the way that young girls in, um, in, engage with becoming women mm -hmm. and engage with boys and, and yeah. older older men. And things like that, and I and I thought that that was also such a great way to submerge the reader in this kind of reality of um, the ways that a community can fail you, mm -hmm. and the ways that girls can become blamed um, mm -hmm. for the for being victims, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so yeah, and then there's also the alcoholism. So it's mm -hmm. in this way we see Numi going through all of these things that are normalized, and then we see the result of what could happen, which is Asha, right? So we're kind of allowed to put things together between what, how, how can one be sane in this type of environment mm -hmm. as a woman? Mm -hmm. um, and so Asha, we're able to see what can become through Asha um, and the limitations that she has um, in her life. Mm -hmm. And, but we never, like, what do you, what is it that you feel like, um, why do you feel like you needed to have Asha um, struggling with alcoholism? Like, I would love to hear about that choice just because that was um, also something that's often depicted as masculine mm -hmm. in, you know, in all kind of cultural art. It's, it's usually like the man is the addict, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's very rare that you see the woman as the addict. So I'm curious about why you made that choice um, here. 
Well, um, you know, alcoholism and addiction uh, runs in my family. Mm. So it was always something I wanted to explore in my writing and my art. And I think that I was always really um, intrigued by the, the way that a, a woman who is an addict is portrayed in, in popular culture versus a man who somehow his addiction is almost to a great extent heroic. Like it adds to his charisma. Mm -hmm. If you think of all the great writers who mm -hmm. you know, drank themselves to death, right. Hemingway and right. Carver, right. you know, it was like another brick in the edifice of their male genius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but for women, it's like there is nothing, you know, heroic or there is nothing like monumental about drinking. It's just they're messy, they're tragic, they're wretches. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the way that they are. The, 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 it kind of flattens them, right? You know, it gives right. instead of like giving them more dimension, it kind of just makes them into just one thing, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is an addict. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in India, in India especially, like um, drinking is is just generally drinking is um, to a great extent taboo for women. Mm -hmm. And then you know, to have a a woman who's an addict or an alcoholic. And who's publicly, you know, public about it is like absolutely unthinkable. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, and growing up as the child of such a woman, the mm -hmm. kind of shame and the kind of, you know, cloud that you live under mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is staggering, mm -hmm. you know. So you were able to pull from your own personal experiences mm -hmm. with shame because shame is kind of this. Yeah. This, this cloud hovering over the entire text. It's coming from yeah. so many, it's it's very heavy and, and you feel it throughout and it never really relents. Um, and you're able to show the different forms that shame can mm -hmm. take so well. And so it, it makes sense that you're saying that you've experienced them in this in some way. So was this character, um, a lot of this drawn from your own experiences with your um, family? So I think shame uh, takes on a different dimension in Indian culture. Like, you know, when Indians say have some shame, it, it mean, doesn't just mean have some shame, it also means have some self-respect. Yeah. Like, how can you do this? Have some shame. <laughs> it actually means that, you know, respect yourself mm -hmm. more. So it's it's entangled, it's entwined. Um, with, the pride. I, with pride. With mm -hmm. pride, you know, which is really very interesting and, and uh, bizarre. So, um, yeah, and I think that how shame is used to control, especially women, mm -hmm. and how women who transgress shame in some way by doing things that society does not condone, mm -hmm. how they are punished and how they are, you know, minimized and how they are kind of uh, put in their place, mm -hmm. whatever that may be, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's like getting, dr you know, sloppy drunk or whether it's, you know, sleeping around or whatever it is, how there is this almost like a like a white blood cell response to that mm -hmm. by society that no this woman has to be kind of contained yeah you know yeah and the men the men in the book um, are not it's all it's almost as if people don't know how to respond to the men when they do things that are inappropriate in the book yeah um, kind of like um, Mimi's friend who is like well that's my brother so yeah you know what do you want me to do and it's like well I mean, I'm not saying you should, but you're using shame for everything else. Mm -hmm. Why not use a little bit of that, you know? Yeah. But that doesn't exist for the men in the book at all. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say that's very much what I saw growing up, is that men were given a lot of allowance to kind of make mistakes or, you know, hurt people and be destructive. Mm -hmm. And they were never really kind of brought to book Mm -hmm. in terms of like even when their families found out or like there's always and it's not just like it's not just the men letting men get away with stuff it's also women yeah. very much like enabling uh misogyny you know totally. the mothers the mothers the yeah, sisters and what power that gives them you know what what is that strange feeling that they're able to embody through their sons yeah um that's happening um it's it's not something that's easy to break down but you can see that you can feel that on the page how the mothers are kind of wielding their sons um, oh, in front yes. of them oh, as yeah. these kind of shields to be able to do 
anything they want that they wouldn't normally be able to do. Yeah. And I was wondering about that with Asha and her losing her son. Yeah. And what about that? You know, why was that the fact that he was a boy mm -hmm. seemed relevant? And was she wanting to tap into that herself? Um, obviously, having a, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't necessarily, it was more like a stillbirth, or he died actually after a week, so it wasn't even a miscarriage, right? Yeah. So she had this moment of having a son, yeah. and then that was taken away from her. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's really interesting. I never thought about it as the idea that of mothers wielding their son's masculinity or kind of like, you know, having power by proxy, but right. that makes so much sense. Um, and I think that, yeah, I think for Asha, like, you know, having a son, like I'll tell you when I was born, um, my, 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 I was born in a small nursing home and uh, there was a lady who was also having a grandchild in the next room or whatever and she asked my grandmother, like, oh, so, um, you know, what, what did you, what did you get? <laughs> and she was like, I had a granddaughter. And she's like, oh, don't worry, next time. You know, it's always like, it's okay, don't, don't stress out. And my grandmother is like, just, she thought that was funny. Right. But like, there's definitely that whole like, you know, it's all right, like consolation prize, like, you know, yeah. trial right. run. From you birth, can, you Yeah, at least you know she's fertile. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. So. Yeah, that's crazy. You yeah. know, it's like, you're an apology from the beginning, and then you do that for the rest of your life. Yeah, you're you're an apology from the beginning, and it's not like when you talk about male preference, it's not like you know your brother's given a little crown and a scepter and sat on a throne. It's more like it's like death by a thousand cuts, right? Like he gets the biggest piece of cake, mm -hmm. but if you say something, you're gaslighted. Like what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like he's not, you know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, your brother gets to go out as long as he wants he gets to hang out with people that you don't you're not allowed to speak to mm -hmm. because it'll harm your reputation now, i'm talking about stuff like this is i'm talking about really small town okay it's, right. it's different like if you grew up in the city your experience might be slightly different but um so yeah you definitely grew up thinking you're lesser than right 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 and your position that way so she's already um everyone is also saying to mumu like oh I feel sorry for your husband. I feel sorry for whoever yeah. you marry. And yeah, then... whoever's going to own you yes. next. I feel so sorry for him. Right. And yeah, I think that as a woman, you're constantly apo you're you're made to apologize for taking up space. And if you don't apologize, mm -hmm. if that doesn't immediately, you know, if you don't immediately um, make amends for like existing in this world, I think that people just even. I mean. I'm not even talking about like raising your voice or just like just being unapologetically mm -hmm. present is enough to trigger some some mm -hmm. people, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we see that in the book, yeah. you know. And then we see Numi. One thing I was reading this book uh, with my daughter, and she okay. was saying when we got to part two, um, she was saying, you know, one thing that I see is that Numi is trying to run, but everything has come with her. Yeah, everything has come with her to Bombay and then. Um, and I thought that that was, that was so on point. It was like, yeah, she tried, she thought that by leaving this village and leaving this town and mm -hmm. going to a bigger city and starting a whole new life, mm -hmm. that she would be set free mm -hmm. from this past. Um, so maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how you kind of moved Numi forward and what you were kind of illustrating with those shifts and then her meeting her own partner. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, I think that Numi, you know, finally breaks free and she, but she's not, she's not the most self-reflexive uh, of characters, right? So mm -hmm. she's carrying, she's carrying everything within her, but she thinks it's all external. Mm -hmm. um, but she's taking it everywhere she goes. She's taking it into every relationship she's into. Right. Um, and I think that for all her, like, wanting to break free and be unconventional, her, she has very conventional, like, needs. Like, she wants to get married and mm -hmm. she wants to have a successful, you know, she wants that validation that comes with right. marriage and, like, heteronormativity and right. just being, like, and I think that that comes from just, again, I, I think it comes from the conditioning that, you know, from the time that you're, like, a little girl, you're given, like, a groom doll and a bride doll to play with and you pretend marry your cousins mm -hmm. and you, you know like you know like the idea of marriage is like 
fed to us from such a young age. Right. And there's also this whole thing that your parents will say that, you know, you can do whatever you want after you're married. Mm -hmm. is, a, is a thing that women often hear that mm -hmm. don't don't go out late now don't do all this but when you're married you can do mm -hmm. whatever you want with your husband <laughs> so you think that marriage is some great ticket to like liberation and freedom and uh, all those right. things and you know when Numi meets me like he seems like a liberal guy mm -hmm. he's, he's not like you know offended he's not trying to treat her like property so mm -hmm. she's like cool like this guy looks like you know I can do whatever I want but I still get all the 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 validation right. and, the, yeah, and the respect, but then he brings her back to his family. Right, when and the family <laughs> comes, then everything shifts, right? Everything shifts. And he expects her to know all of the things and all of the ways that she should behave. Yeah. Um, and he's giving her these looks and, you know, nudging her and kicking her under the table, like yeah. doing all these things, and she's like, wait a minute, you know, I'm yeah. already in too deep, and you're showing me exactly who you are. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's also interesting how he regresses mm -hmm. along with, like, he's a different person. And I again, I, this is, again, from personal experience, I've seen men who are incredibly liberal and incredibly, quote-unquote, think that they're very feminist. <laughs> um, but the minute they're back with mommy and daddy, it's like suddenly, you know, they just don't want to, they just don't want to right. rock the boat or upset or, like, create, you know, uh, acrimony so they they just like okay we'll just do whatever right. our parents want us to do right. and I think Veer is like that um, he doesn't want to rock the boat and he doesn't want no, I mean he brings this person who's clearly not uh, you know inured to the culture of his mm -hmm. family and then he kind of expects her as you said to kind of just know instinctively what, what to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Which I think comes from the religious, the difference in religion. So Numi is a Parsi, mm -hmm. and her husband is a Punjabi Hindu. Mm -hmm. And like, if he brought if he brought a Punjabi girl to his house, like, yeah, she'd know exactly what to do and where everything was. And but right. Numi is not didn't grow up like that, you know. Right. So that's right. where the cultural which, uh, like his mother is sure to yeah. her mind. Yeah. Oh yes. I see. Yes. Oh yeah. And, and then the family feels like, oh, don't worry, we will teach you, you know, we will make you one of us. And that's right. also like really... Through force and shame. Through force and shame. Exactly. Of course. Well, I definitely could talk with you about this book forever uh -huh. and share a lot of the same feelings that you felt at Columbia around this kind of shame that can come up yeah. around motherhood. And similarly, I didn't start even thinking about writing as a profession until yeah. I was, you know, um, until I had my daughter. Yeah. So there is this way that it kind of, like like the book, is like it makes a mirror to you and it's like, what do you want to reflect back to this person and are you the person that you want to see when you look in the mirror and that you'll feel okay looking your child in the eye? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I felt a lot of those same things. So, yeah, I mean, the shame feels almost... Um, just innate to yeah. womanhood. Oh yeah. Um, and that's very much uh, on the page and it comes through very, very heavily. Um, it's palpable. Yeah. Um, so I want to open it up to everyone and see um, what questions we have. Yeah. On the heat, does anyone, has anyone been thinking about something that they'd like to bring up um, and ask? I, I just wanted to add to what you said is that one thing good is that I met writer parents like you and mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a function of like age and time and just being in this world for longer, but I started out in the MFA thinking that these are two parts of my life that are completely separate mm -hmm. and have nothing to do with each other. But now I feel that being a mother and being a parent is is vital and uh, inextricable from being for me being an artist. I could not be the artist I am if I wasn't also the mother I am, mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. parent I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that realization that those two halves of my life, actually one whole, has dawned on me gradually and through the mm -hmm. the, the pleasure and the joy of knowing other writer parents like yourself. Yes, so I thank agree. You. Thank you. I feel the same way. Yes, <laughs> I feel like I would... I was so dumb before. <laughs> I, didn't have, I wasn't thinking about anything. But I can also tell that on the page. There's just a way that I think certain artists are able to approach things and understand humanity um, when they have some engagement with children and older people. 
Yeah. Um, it just feels like you can feel that in their work. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And I feel the same way about you. I was like, there's this other person there who has a kid. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Um, but everyone, there were so many young people coming straight from undergrad. And yeah. Like, um, so yeah. All right. Who has a question? Don't be shy, you guys. <laughs> Anything. significant relationship with another woman is of course with her mom and of course the woman who raises her, her Aya. Um, but throughout the book, her, most of her dominant relationships are with men, mm -hmm. um, which to me is very interesting, whether it's the act of returning to the room of someone who has violated her in the past, mm -hmm. who has, you know, who has shown uh, no signs of being better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the explicit choice that she makes to align herself with him mm -hmm. in that event over everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder how much of that, you know, is to underline the idea that she doesn't have any female allies. Mm -hmm. That perhaps being shamed by the women is somehow more piercing than mm -hmm. being a possible violation by a mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost, you know, like you, you get what you see mm -hmm. versus here there's all this like, saccharine, you know, and but there's there's so much like almost evil mm -hmm. under it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I wonder if that was the it was an explicit choice to keep Asha the dominant female figure in her life. Mm. So um, you're asking about Numi's relationship with um, the male figures that are really complicated in the book yes. and um, how Asha was her main feminine um, yeah, ally it, yeah. and how she was shamed by so many other women and if that was a device that was used yeah. in the book um, to illuminate that. Uh, I think that's a really good question. I think that Numi... Um, to a certain extent uh, is, um, I think we all, when we're younger to, or of a certain age, we're kind of socialized to believe, to view other women as the competition mm -hmm. for the attention of men rather mm -hmm. than allyship. Mm -hmm. And allyship, when it does exist, is of a very saccharine, you know, very artificial nature, which is not really grounded in shared trauma or shared, mm -hmm. like, um, experiences because women are again socialized to be reserved don't trust anybody don't tell anyone your secrets mm -hmm. don't talk to you know only talk to whoever your um, your social your family approves of mm -hmm. so women are very restricted in in how much they can um, connect with other women and other girls and i think for numi um, you know because of her mother's reputation and mother being the dominant like person in her in her life it, it, she's kind of not really welcome in you know you have this there's a scene right before she follows um sid into the room is that all the other women are kind of sitting in a circle and like chatting and gossiping and numi's you can see numi standing outside that circle mm -hmm. and she's looking at the women kind of bonding and mm -hmm. the, you know his fiance is sitting in the center like this glittering jewel mm -hmm. and and i think at that point she really wants to punish them for mm -hmm. making her you know witness that and be an outsider and witness her own outsidership mm -hmm. and she has a bit of main character syndrome right like she mm -hmm. wants to you know fuck it up yeah so she that's why i think she follows uh, sid into the room and even though she knows he's dangerous and he's uh, he's harmful he's the only one who'll have her mm -hmm. like right. she's not she's not welcome anywhere else right you know? right yeah i so. thought it was so heartbreaking just before that scene when her friend she says, can we be friends again? And she's like, I'm yeah. sorry about what my brother did to you, but yeah, you're damaged goods and I don't want you to rub off on me, essentially. Which yeah. I, I just thought that was more heartbreaking than Sid and everything else was like, she needs a friend so badly. And this woman is sitting here telling her, I miss you, but, yeah, you know. Um, and then, you know, that's when she follows Sid into the room mm -hmm. and... You know, he's the only one who's even seeing her. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess it's like, at least I'm being seen. It's better than being invisible. 
Yeah. So somehow the damage of women doesn't rub off on the men in mm-hmm. the book. So women can hang up. Men can hang out with damaged women, but they have to keep their wives and their girlfriends and their sisters like away so that they won't be ca- contaminated. Mm-hmm. And again, that's something I saw growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like somebody like Numi, the only people she would have access to are people like Sid or like other dudes who would not necessarily have you know have to pay for hanging out with her. Right. 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 Thank you for that question. Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Do we have another question? Yes. I I worked there, but I I was really curious. I I really loved um, this book. I think there's been like a growing influx of these of new age character, right? Sad girls, sad Mm -hmm. sad hot girls, sad hot girls. Um, (laughs) So the sad archetypes, and if they're actually helping um, these women to be seen, or if they're working in the opposite direction and right. becoming more destructive um, to women's uh, mental health. Um, yeah, there is this whole sad girl movement, but I don't know how much it's actually penetrating um, the surface. Um, but you're right, so Numi is this sad girl. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about this. So I'm going to be controversial, a little controversial here and say that, like, I think I just read a list how it's like sad hot girl summer. (laughs) And, uh, you know, what to read for sad hot girl summer. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And I have to say, all the writers on that list were white. Mm. And I've been thinking about this. There was this really great, um, essay that I read a couple of years ago about who gets to be free bag mm. you know it was this um this this brilliant writer a writer of color and she was talking about like who gets to be that messy person who gets to get who gets to have you know create disaster for herself and still get buy-in from the audience and the reader and it's not uh women of color right right you know right yeah um so I think that and I, I, I do think that's a problem. And I think it's changing slowly, but I do think that now we have, we've started to accept messy, fragmented characters, mm-hmm. but as long as they're... Right, because that's the redemption. That's the The redemption. whiteness is the redemption. Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't think we're at that point where, you know, women of color get to be like fuck, up and fuck ups and still earn the audience's in, um, uh, empathy. Right, yeah, I think that that's... I'm just going through so many books in my head right now, and I'm just yeah, thinking like, about think that. About but it, yeah, right? that's totally true. Um, who gets to be the sad hot girl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're you're definitely not sad and hot yeah. <laughs> if you're Asha. Yeah, nobody thinks Asha's sad and hot. Yeah, very few people think Numi's sad and hot right. too. Right, right, you know? right. Like, yeah. So whose sadness and whose um, messiness is romanticized is a, is a question that. I think is interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that question. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Yeah, that's so true. Bring on the controversy. <laughs> Any other questions? Is that a normal? Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> is that a, is that a often reaction that you get that a reader wants to hug the main char- character, or do you get the opposite reaction? <laughs> the question is. Like, oh my God, this person needs to get it. <laughs> Right. More, one more dive into the deep end. Right. The question is if Nahid often has the main character um, that people feel sorry for them and that people want to hug them. Um, 
do you hear that? I mean, I personally didn't want to hug Mimi. No. <laughs> and that's what was making me feel bad as a reader. I was like, like why Numi's is not the problem. Yeah. Don't be mad at Numi. Yeah. You know, but I was I was mad at Numi often. I was yeah. just like, come on, girl. <laughs> Do better. <laughs> you know, I wanted her to make better choices. But, you know, when she left for Bombay, I was like, yes. But then I was like, wait, how's that going to work out? You know? Yeah. Um, but what do you think? Um, I th I've got both uh, both ends of the spectrum of that reaction. I've had people say that I really connected with her. I th I, again, it, it really it is a reflection of like you you will you will bump up against the limits of your empathy when it comes to this character. This character is supposed to push you uh, to figure out where you like. You may think it's like you know you might think you're super empathetic and uh -huh. that you will take in all types and then you'll come across somebody like Numi and uh -huh. you'll realize, okay, wait, no, I'm not as, you know, yeah. kind as I thought. Yeah, I'm or not progressive. As, I'm, right? I'm not as, prog I'm mm -hmm. not as woke as I thought. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I have limits. Mm -hmm. um, but the opposite, I love to talk about this. I just love to talk about it, even though I should not be talking about it. Um, there was a review in a newspaper in India, which is like one of the biggest, most liberal newspapers. And the headline of the review, you know, I think you know which one I'm talking about. The headline of that review was, Shut Up, Numi. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I don't know, the, the, wow. I really, she really triggered that reviewer because right. yeah. she was like, I want to slap her. Yeah. Like she literally said that, I want to slap her. Yeah. Like, and then she's like, how, you know, like entitled brat. and. I was like, oh, no. wow. I, you know, like, why isn't the why isn't this reviewer excited that she's she's reacting so viscerally to a right. fictional character? Right. Yeah. You know. Definitely. Like, why isn't she exploring that? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's great that you're feeling that way, but fucking figure out why. You right. know. She should have took a couple of more days with that review. Yeah. Get some processing with her therapist. Yeah. But I definitely felt the same. I saw, I identified with Numi in mm -hmm. many ways, and so the things that I feel unhappy with with my own self. I was unhappy with with Numi. Yeah, you know she wasn't yeah. speaking out about. You know, there's so much that I felt um, a connection with her to, but in these ways that uh, ways that I'm not proud of. Mm -hmm. You know, and so in that way, she made me feel, um, you know, on guard, and um, she made me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it sounds like that reviewer probably had a similar kind of yeah, yeah feeling, but it's like. I'm not able to always have that empathy for myself. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't extending that to Numi all the time. Yeah. And sometimes I was, but then, you know, because there were so many things that I connected with with her, yeah. it made it hard for me to have um, a lot of empathy for her in some moments. You know, the, the poet um, Salma Sharif, um, she was in Congress. She had this great interview with um, Ricky Laurentis, I think mm -hmm. the name is. And they were talking about empathy and how useless empathy is <laughs> as an emotion mm -hmm. because it's so restricted to who we who we identify with. And if you only read characters who you can empathize with, if you only read characters that you can cheer for, then you're just you're not you know you're not growing. You're not right. like you're not exploring um, the possibilities of your own psyche. Yeah, because. You're just you're just in a little bubble. You're in like a little goldfish bowl, going around and around with the same kind of you know. And the whole idea that we should always give people a character to cheer for, I really I really right. want to rub up like push up against yes, that as I much as I that. can. I don't really like to cheer for anyone, even in real life. So <laughs> I, my characters need to reflect that. I'm disappointed in everyone. <laughs> we all need to do better. And that's why I thought, I, I you guys have to read this book if you haven't read it. Please get it. Nikita's gonna sign some copies, but I mean, it's so complicated and it's just so devastating and it's so beautiful and it's just it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. And I just want to say congratulations. Thank and you. I'm sure it was so hard for you to go in and make all of these edits and revisions and complicate this character and just all the nuances that are just between the lines, even. You know, not even on the word level, but just, you know, what you leave for the reader between the lines, um, the silences that you leave. Mm -hmm. There's just so much beauty in that. Um, but thank you uh, for being here with us and for sharing this work with us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you, guys.
thank you so much, everyone, again. And thank you, Nahid and Sasha, for such wonderful conversation. Mm -hmm. As a reminder, um, Sasha, sorry, Nahid will be signing <laughs> at the back desk. So please wait to approach the desk until she's gotten settled back there. Um, you can purchase additional copies of Mirror Made of Rain at our signing desk. And for those of us who are still on YouTube, you can find the link to purchase books in the description. Um, that is all for me. So thank you again for joining us. Please join me in giving uh, Nahid and Sasha one last round of applause. Thank you.